Welcome again, and thank you for your presence. I want to introduce our next speaker, who is Eric Schlieser. He is now at Ghent University in Belgium, where he is a research professor in history and philosophy of science. Most of you, all of you know him. He is very active. Before he came to Ghent, he was in Leiden, and before that, somewhere in the United States. But I honestly do not know anymore where exactly that was. Syracuse. Syracuse, voila. Uh, Eric has done a lot of work on different aspects of Newton's scholarship and on the Nachleben of this uh, um, uh, yeah, early modern uh, philosophy uh, stuff. He is working currently on links with Spinoza, with Toland, and we will hear about this in his uh, next paper. And I guess that the discussion will be, as always, when Eric speaks, very vivid and very uh, engaged. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm going to be speaking about one sentence in the general scholium. Turns out it was added to my horror to the third edition and not the second edition, so I've missed the anniversary, or I'm too early for the anniversary. Um, um, maybe I'm still allowed in the volume. We'll have to talk about it. Uh, it's this sentence, no variation of things arises from blind metaphysical necessity, which must be the same always and everywhere. Um, to my pleasure, it hasn't actually been cited yet. Um, um, my paper is really a good follow-up to Andrew Yaniak's and uh, in different ways to Mary Domsky's paper, um, which I think is also a first, Andrew, that I feel like I'm building on you rather than disagreeing. Uh, with you. Um, I, I'm going to relate this to Spinoza and Spinozism and the way in which Newton is offering an argument against Spinozism here. Um, I do want to mention the oddity that we've had a whole conference on the general scholium where we have not mentioned Locke. So I feel like I'm introducing Spinoza into the conversation, which he belongs. But maybe at some moment we're going to have to reflect that somehow we've utterly written Locke out of the general scholium. Uh, um, and I think there's an important connection with Locke and Spinoza too. So uh, I mentioned that with, uh, with some uh, interest. Thank you, Steve, Scott, and Stefan for inviting me. Um, this sentence has an argument. I've laid it out. Um, necessity implies homogeneity. Homogeneity and variety are disjunctive. We observe variety, therefore no metaphysical necessity. I have to say that this argument pattern to appeal to the empirical world in order to kind of get rid of metaphysical f commitments of some sort or another is something that the Newtonians, and I say this in a diffuse sense, will do more and more in the 18th century. Uh, they appeal to the authority of science in all kinds of different ways in order to settle what looked like initially metaphysical uh, debates. Um, I'm using these words right now loosely, but later hopefully I'll put some content to it. Um, so for me, the afterlife of this argumentative pattern is very important. I call that, in fact, Newton's challenge in my other research. Today I want to look at what does this pattern actually mean and what argument does it really settle. So first, who's the target? I will claim it's Spinozism. In fact, uh, I'll be the fourth person to mention Toland in this conference. I think uh, Toland is the target here and not Spinoza. And we can actually show why Spinoza himself could not have been the target of this claim, uh, whereas Toland probably was. Um, what's the aim of this argument? I'm not going to spend a lot of time showing this. I think the paragraph in which it's embedded makes it very clear. It's to use physics natural philosophy, whatever your favorite term is, to discern finality in nature. Um, but that's um, the aim of it. Question is how convincing is this argument? Turns out that the, as you delve into it, um, it's not so easy to answer that question. Some historians are not really interested in answering this, but I think philosophically as we pursue it, we learn more and more about the historical uh, setting of this argument. Am I still in, in, yeah, okay, great. Oh, that was wrong. So I'll give you my thesis. I'll talk a bit about Spinoza. I will argue that Spinoza actually could not have been a direct 
target of this argument. Um, I will show that I think um, some plausible reason to think that Newton realizes it can't be Spinoza. Then I go to Clark um, and I look at the letters with Butler in a demonstration. I take for granted something that actually some of you also I think have implied, but if you put the de a demonstration next to the general scolium, the overlaps are just unbelievable. Every paragraph in the general scolium has predecessors in a demonstration. Not just a few here or there, but all of them. Um, I'm not claiming that these arguments originated with Clark, but there's just very important things. The differences are also non-trivial, and I'll mention one or two of them. Then I'll go to Toland, because Clark's a demonstration is by its own lights a response in part to Toland. Um, then I'll introduce some of my uh, own philosophic uh, take on the 18th century, and I'll show that Toland instantiates what I call uh, anti-mathematics. Uh, that's meant to be anachronistic, so that you really don't get confused about uh, what it is I'm doing. But that Toland's version of anti-mathematics causes problems for Newton, because on the one hand he appropriates Newton, and the other hand he gives Newton a twist that horrifies Clark and presumably Newton to some degree. Um, and then I'll return to Newton and the status of this argument. That's what I want to do. Um, Toland Spinozism is the target. Toland complicates matters, but also I think allows us to say something about what the general scolium is up to. Um, one thing I take for granted, and I'm glad that um, uh, Scott said this many times, I take for granted that early readers of Newton discern Spinozism in Newton, whether justified or not. And I take the general scolium in part to be saying, no, 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 don't do that. And that's what I think this argument that I just showed you is part of that effort. <coughs> so first, what's the target? It's blind metaphysical necessity. Interestingly, that phrase, um, I haven't actually found precursors to, but I found a lot of precursors, both before and after Newton, that have variants on this claim. And always the variant always has a name attached to it, it's Spinoza. Now to be clear, sometimes Spinozism and Epicureanism get conflated, including in a text that I'm discussing here, but not when this phrase is used. Blindness and necessity, that's a way to connect uh, to Spinozism. Uh, and you can understand why, because the blindness my wife's a retina surgeon, so I try to avoid talking about blindness. But blindness in this context means denies final causes. You only have formality, but you don't have goals. Um, um, and in fact, um, once you pay attention to it, uh, Newton too uses the phrase outside uh, the general <coughs> scholium as well. So I think 18th century readers could understand part of the sentence I'm trying to explain as actually directed at Spinoza because everybody else was using that language in order to talk about Spinoza. Uh, that doesn't settle it, but I'll get to more. Okay, here's Spinoza. There's no general audience here, so I'm not going to have to talk about him. Um, um, now, does the argument actually refute Spinoza? You might think yes, because indeed Spinoza is committed to blind uh, metaphysical necessity. He's against final causes. Nature is deterministic. It's exceptionless. And moreover, now it gets interesting, Spinoza is committed to the principle of sufficient reason. And in Spinoza, and generally, the principle of sufficient reason has extremely low tolerance for uh, variability and arbitrariness. Um, and in fact, Spinoza has a well-known problem that in the literature is generally attributed to Hegel, namely how to explain the existence of finite modes, which are in some sense arbitrary too, and um, um, not in the right way the product of uh, the causa sui. And then you might think that variety, empirical variety, is just a special case of that general problem. I could spend a lot more time explaining this, but uh, hopefully it's intuitive. Yeah, yes. Moreover, within Spinoza's ethics, the two problems are connected because the way entities are defined is in terms of motion. The way motion, which is not defined, is expli explicated in the ethics is in terms of entities. So the two hang together in a kind of internal way. Um, moreover, and this is something that Clark uh, 
and I'll return to this later, that Clark emphasizes in the demonstration, is in order to observe variety, it would seem that on Spinoza's view, there would have to be a variety from the start of the universe. I say start between square quotes because Spinoza has uh, an uh, eternal list view. There is no start to the universe for him. Um, and if you assume a homogeneous plenum, as Spinoza does and admits he does, it's very hard to see how you should actually be able to generate variants at all uh, in Spinoza's system. I believe, and this is speculation, that that's the question that Bentley asked Newton in part that set off the letters. Namely, how do you get a, from a plenum, how do you develop variety? And interestingly enough, that's not the question that Newton twice not answers. He answers one, the question, finite plenum, which is not Spinoza's position, or infinite, but not a plenum, but with uh, pockets of matter. I reread the letters this morning, and uh, Bentley comes back to Newton, and Newton never answers this question. Very surprising. Um, okay, unfortunately, what, uh, this makes life interesting, that's not Spinoza's position. Because for Spinoza, from the necessity of the divine nature must follow an infinite number of things in infinite ways, that is all things which can fall within the sphere of infinite in intellect. This does not imply homogeneity. Rather, his view seems to be that all possible variety is a consequence of the divine nature. Now, for those of you who know your metaphysics and know your Spinoza, um, this notion of the possible is a little bit tricky because Spinoza is an actualist. There's only one course of nature. That's what we have. There are no alternative genuine possibilities in Spinoza's view. Um, even so, if you just look at Proposition 16 of the Ethics, it looks like he just endorses as a matter of fact variety as a necessary consequence of um, uh, the infinite intellect or substance. Moreover, and this is not an argument that we find in Spinoza, but we find it in Leibniz's Theodicy, on Leibniz's understanding of the PSR, you automatically get variety. In fact, the whole point of the PSR in Leibniz is to secure variety, right? So this initial line of argument can't do justice to Newton's view if Newton has a reasonable sensibility about what's going on in the original text. Now, when I dealt with this material before, thank you, Mary, for publishing it and also rewriting the piece for clarity, um, if not improving it. Um, I basically said something like this. Um, I hope you do more of that in, in my life. Um, <laughs> it's on film. Um, at best, what we have here is a burden-shifting argument. Um, Spinoza may have uh, sufficient explanation for the existence of variety. Newton says very reasonably you cannot account for particular variety because for that you need a good physics. Spinoza, by everybody's light, doesn't have that physics. Moreover, we have an empirical argument, Boyle's vacuum, that shows that the plenum account is probably uh, false, etc. Interestingly enough, the Boyle's vacuum stuff doesn't appear in the first edition of the Principia. It's really a second edition claim. Uh, unsatisfying. That's where I was. Now, um, before I go to Clark and Tolan to give the historical interpretation of the passage, I just want to point out that I think um, this text, which has been cited by Anthony Duchesne and even the great Snowballon, um, is often taken to be as something anti-Cartesian, but the views that are being rejected here are Spinozist, not Cartesian. Uh, this is, I think, a proof text for query 23 or question 23. I leave it to the scholars to exactly date this. But it's very, I'll, I do want to read it uh, through with you. Even arguments for a deity if not taken from phenomena are slippery and serve only for ostentation. This uh, rejects cosmological and ontological arguments. So this is an important difference between Clark and uh, and Newton. I'm not saying this is all, he always holds this, but given the absence of the cosmological argument in the general scholium, I think this is actually very significant. Okay, an atheist will allow that there's a being absolutely perfect necessarily existing in the author of mankind and call it nature. 
I think that can be no doubt at this moment when he's talking about Spinoza. Um, why uh, reputable scholars think this is anti-Cartesian, I don't know, because that's Descartes, Descartes tries very hard not to say this. Um, if you talk of infinite wisdom or of any perfection more than he allows to be in nature, he'll reckon in a chimera, also very Spinozistic, and tell you that you have the notion of finite or limited wisdom from what you find in yourself, and you're able of yourself to prefix the word not or more to any verb or adjective without the existence of wisdom not limited. That, I admit, sounds like Descartes more than Spinoza. That one part. But, or wisdom more finite to understand the meaning of the phrase as easily as mathematicians understand what is meant by an infinite line or infinite area, that's just Spinoza's letter on the infinite, where he ridicules the claims by mathematically inclined philosophers to do, <laughs> to confuse claims about nature and substance with claims about mathematics, and that they're in fact very different epistemic standards. Um, I could say a lot more about that, but I just want to say this is the letter on the infinite. Nothing, I think, like that in Spinoza, uh, in Descartes. And he may tell you further that the author of mankind was destitute of wisdom and design because there was no final causes. Again, Descartes would never say that. Descartes would say, I'm agnostic about this, it's Spinoza, and there are no final causes in physics, but we don't know. I mean, in fact, part six of the meditations relies on teleological arguments in a non-trivial way. This is, again, Spinoza's ethics, straightforwardly. And then finally, uh, appendix one, that matter is space and therefore necessarily existing, and I've always formed the same quantity of motion would in infinite time run through all variety of forms, again, We've already quoted that passage from the ethics. That's Spinoza, not Descartes. Descartes, Le Monde, and also uh, the principles requires God in non-trivial ways to make sure that we go through this infinite variety. So in my view, um, whether or not Newton ever read Spinoza, um, I'm, you know, I'm not in the business of proving that. All I could say is that Moore and Clark read Spinoza extremely carefully and discussed all the relevant passages. Um, and that Newton here um, almost certainly is picking out a target like Spinoza rather than a target like Descartes. Um, okay, let's go to Clark. Paul, I really wish I could use your picture of a demonstration because the subtitle is it's an attack, sorry, my language is a criticism of Hobbes, Spinoza, and his followers, their followers. Only follower named is uh, Toland, by the way. Um, so, okay. <coughs> That's, I think, the relevant context for this passage. Um, in uh, the, the, a demonstration provoked Butler, then a very young Butler, I should add, to a series of questions the year the General Scolium was published. And they, Butler and Clark had an exchange over this in 1713 and 1714. Um, Butler, the correspondence was only published, I think, in 38. So it would require some work to prove that Newton actually was familiar with the exchange. On the other hand, I take it that this kind of normal procedure, Newton scholarship, that this is the kind of thing you don't have to prove because Clark and Newton are so close in this period, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I'll leave it to the scholars to prove that Newton knew this exchange. I can't, I'm not gonna bother with that. So necessity, absolute, and antecedent in the order of nature to the existence of any subject has nothing to limit it. But if it operates at all, as must needs do, it must operate everywhere and all times alike. Right, so the passage that I'm trying to explain in the general scolium is really a claim about the nature of modality, and namely the modality of necessity. And what it's saying is, is that necessity is of such a type that it has the same impact everywhere and at all times. And intuitive, this is obvious because think about, say, mathematical truths that in some sense might be, as a metaphor now, uh, analogy, that might be um, absolutely necessary. It's going to have to be true everywhere and at all times. That's kind of the analogy, although it's an analogy only because I want to say more about the nature of this modality. Now, it turns out that in Clark, um, this modality is non-trivial. It's what explains the existence of God. So earlier we dis dis discussed that everybody takes for granted God's necessary existence, but in Clark, it's actually necessity that explains God's existence. Um, 
and he actually calls it of necessity is the formal cause of God or substance. Um, that's in an, uh, also a related correspondence, but not the one with Butler. Um, um, in Clark, uh, and I should say also in Spinoza, this is the argument that rules out more than one existing God. Because necessity works in such a way, um, it creates ubiquity, and there's only one substance that gets, uh, gets this necessity attached to it. Um, we can rule out alternative substances. The argument is actually very nice. I'm not going to spell it out. But Clark here <laughs> both provides Spinoza with the answer to Leibniz's famous objection, and he appropriates it for himself. Um, so historically, this is a very important set of arguments. And this way of understanding necessity is shared by Clark and Spinoza, possibly by Newton too. I'm not making any further claims, except that if you accept this interpretation of necessity, Newton's argument in general scrolium becomes much stronger than it is. Um, I'll explain that in a second. Okay. Um, the letter goes on, and I'm going to quote the rest of the letter. The argument is likewise the same in the question about the origin of motion. Motion cannot be necessarily existing because it, being evident that all determinations are equally possible in themselves, the original determination of the motion of any particular body, this ray, rather than the contrary ray, could not be necessary in itself, but was either caused by the will of an intelligent and free agent, or else was an effect produced and determined without any cause at all, which is an express contradiction, as I've shown in my demonstration. I'm going to explain this in a few slides. He, he refers to passage in a de in demonstration, and that's the passage where he's refuting Tolland. I've checked all the editions uh, through that even more vulgar scholarly device, namely uh, Books Google. I've um, uh, plus uh, somewhat less vulgar devices. In all the letters to Butler, he gives the reference to the passage to Toland, against Toland. So it's not something that he added later. It was there. Um, OK, so I've established the following, I think, even if um, we may disagree about the details. The variety argument really targets Toland and actually is targeting Toland on motion. And to see that, I'm going to explain this. Why Toland? That's what I want to explain. And I also want to explain how to Clark's version of the argument is really supposed to work. So Toland's letters we've discussed already, uh, but um, we haven't really said that much about it. There have been allusions to it. Um, I'm going to leave aside today the very interesting first three letters, um, which I think complicate all of this. But the official doctrine of letters four and five is that matter is active, and that this is, in fact, uh, consistent with and um, in fact, implied by the Principia. Um, having said that, he denies the immateriality of the soul. Um, he wants to say that God is imminent, and he definitely wants to deny that God is a cause of motion. Um, rhetorically, the letter is structured around letter. F the, the letters are structured around letter four, a refutation of Spinoza. And then he appeals to the authority of Newton. And then in letter five. Uh, rejects a lot of Newtonian commitments and brings in Spinozistic doctrines. Um, I think Margaret Jacob is the only person who's written on this who doesn't agree with this interpretation. Um, but I really think this is kind of a very, uh, very standard. I think everybody saw it like this. I think Clark definitely sees it like this. Um, Margaret really doesn't think that Toland is much of a Spinozist at all, uh, which I find very strange. But uh, someday I'll, I'll try to argue with that. OK, so now here I want to introduce my own terminology for a second. I use the phrase anti-mathematics as a technical term, Schließer defined term. Namely, it's the expressed reservations about the authority and utility of the application of mathematics. That's what I call anti-mathematics. I actually identify different kinds of anti-mathematical strategies. Today, I'm only interested in what I call the global strategy. Namely, arguments that challenge and deprivilege the epistemic authority and security of mathematical applications as such. Toland does this. And he does it 
by reactivating very traditional distinctions. So I'm not claiming that what he does is original. What he's original about is that he applies it to Newton, even though he claims Newton is great. Um, so the mathematicians, and what he means by mathematicians uh, we can discuss later, generally take the moving force for granted and treat of local motion as they find it, without giving themselves much trouble about its original cause, but the practice of the philosophers is otherwise or rather ought to be. In fact, Tolan proposes a traditional intellectual division of labor. The mathematicians find the rules of motion, um, and the philosophers uh, give us causal explanations. Um, that's, in fact, uh, argued through letters four and five. Uh, moreover, interestingly enough, um, he also insists that the way the mathematicians operate is by probabilistic arguments and not by certain arguments, uh, which in context is uh, quite interesting. Um, this distinction in Toland is a normative distinction, right? Uh, or rather ought to be. Um, crucially, what it means is that mathematicians do not have the last word on their own practice. Um, and that mathematicians are incapable of giving us what we want about the study of nature, namely causal explanations. Um, he interestingly enough asserts that Newton agrees with all of this with him. And he does this by very selective quotation from uh, uh, the Principia. So what I want to claim is that one through three instantiates global anti-mathematics. And Toland, I think, originates a very long and fruitful set of interpretations of the Principia, namely that the Principia itself is instrumentalist. Notice that this is orthogonal to the debate about action at a distance. Irrelevant to that. I mean, it's obviously relevant in other ways, but he just says there's no causal language in the Principia on this account. And if there is, we have to retranslate that, and we philosophers um, are the ones that really settle these issues. Um, reason I think is, I'm not sure if Toland is the very first, but I think he may have been the first. Interesting enough, as the arguments over action at a distance start developing, even Newton's defenders start uh, adopting this stance, but I don't think anybody reading the first edition of the Principia could come away thinking this if you don't have a lot of philosophical motivation to say it. Um, I don't think that's a kind of neutral reading. Um, some other time, well, I've defended that in many places. Okay, crucially, he's also against an act of God. As Cicero observes, when the philosophers are ignorant of the cause of anything, they presently betake themselves for refuge and sanctuary to God, which is not to explain things, but to cover their own negligence or short-sightedness. I hold then that motion is essential to matter, as inseparable from its nature as impenetrability or extension. Right? Um, if you believe that matter is passive, you're going to introduce the God of the gaps. If you think that matter is active, you can really reduce the role of God. A uh, lot more complications here, but that's the general picture. Interestingly enough, I actually think that Clark agrees with this move and exploits it in the other direction. And also, much of the demonstration is an alternative reading of Cicero um, too, um, to kind of remove the sting of this. So uh, to put concisely the formal structure of the Principia as neutral on matter being active and passive, Toland offers a philosophical conception of uh, motion, and he says it follows from that um, that matter is going to be active. And my view, while not identical with the Principia, coheres very well with it. Um, and if you do want to insist that matter is passive, you're going to open yourself up to God of the gaps. Now, Clark responds, and this is my last long uh, quote. One late author indeed has ventured to assert and pretended to prove that motion is essential to matter. Puts a footnote to the letters to Serena here. It's actually the only reference to Toland in the book. So there's only one follower mentioned. That's Toland, and Toland's only mentioned one. Uh, the essential tendency to motion of every one or any one particular particle of matter in this author's imaginary infinite plenum must be either a tendency to move one determinate way at once or to move every way at once, 
a tendency to move some determinant away cannot be essential to any particle of matter, but must arise from some external cause because there's nothing in the pretended necessary nature of any particle determine its motion necessarily and essentially one way rather than another. And a tendency or conatus equally to move every way at once is either an absolute contradiction or these could produce nothing in matter but an eternal rest of all and every one of its parts. So uh, there are two claims here. One is that directionality is not built into the nature of matter. Five minutes? Perfect. Um, and in fact, if directionality were inherent in matter, you'd be in the Epicurean position, the one that Newton distanced himself from in the Bentley letters. And in fact, the position that Spinoza ridicules in his correspondence is Boyle, because Spinoza thinks Boyle definitely accepts this. Um, more interestingly, um, it also implies that you cannot automatically assume rectilinear motion into your law of inertia. Um, that needs to, if you believe in metaphysics, that needs to be justified. And this actually is part of Spinoza's criticism of Descartes. So this has actually a very long tradition um, in 17th century. So this means that if you think directionality um, is somehow really connected to matter, you either have God super added to it, or it has to be the first billiard ball cause of the world that gives you all subsequent uh, uh, inertial motion. Um, and Clark says, uh, Toland is not entitled to either of these two uh, options. Couldn't rule that out. Um, the second argument I've actually never understood, Mary's helped me a little bit, uh, but maybe I still don't understand it. If motion is intrinsic to matter, then there would be no motion. That's sort of Clark's position. Um, he repeats this argument later in the demonstration where he targets Spinoza directly with the same argument. It's actually nearly identical wordings. It's not entirely clear why motion is ruled out on this argument. I'm going to say a little bit. But if it were true, you have a nice argument independent of contested views about the vacuum in a plenum. Right? So then you could sort of sort out the empirical and the metaphysical nicely. Um, so before, with the aid of Domsky, um, I figured out the following. Anybody will have tendencies or determinations to motion in every direction. Any determination in a body, for any determination, it will be an opposing determination that cancels out. Therefore, the body does not move. It will be a perpetual rest. Something like this seems to be what Clark has in mind. But it's not clear why we, where we get this first premise from. Um, after all, absolute necessity has the same impact everywhere and at all times and should have the same consequence everywhere and at all times. Um, and in fact, if you think about it, um, you could actually strengthen this with appeal to the PSR, but since I'm out of time, I won't do that. So it looks like absolute necessity requires that each bit of matter must behave identically everywhere and at all times so that all bodies either remain at absolute rest or have an absolute identical uniform motion. This is, I think, the second argument that Clark has. Interestingly enough, Toland rejects the uh, possibility that matter can be absolutely at rest. And so he's, as it were, begging the question, and Clark has a successful argument against him. Spinoza, on the other hand, rejects the possibility that matter can have an absolutely identical, absolute uniform motion. And so it's also refuted. So there is a sense in which Clark actually gets both targets at one with this argument, except that you have to really do a lot of hard work to suggest that they're really committed to it, and I'm going to take it back. So I give you two conclusions. Um, as we all know, in the first edition of the Principia, Newton is uh, agnostic on the activity and passivity of matter. Um, I think he was naturally read this saying matter is active, but you know, I think other readings are possible. Clark's criticism of Spinoza and Toland makes the passivity of matter theologically far more attractive. And um, I think you, know, you might then read me as saying, okay, the general scolium then embraces the passivity of matter in this uh, variety argument, that that's kind of a necessary consequence. I don't think um, that's true. I think Newton still has other options available. 
He can have super addition. He can have relational contingent quality of matter. And he can deny what we've been calling absolute necessity. And in fact, he does deny absolute necessity in the queries to the optics. Um, thereby to vary the laws of nature and make worlds of several sorts and several parts of the universe. The world really could have been otherwise. So where do we leave us? It turns out that Newton and Clark only apply absolute necessity to infinite beings, God, space, duration, um, and apply a different modality to laws and finite beings. Right? So they themselves um, do not embrace absolute necessity for all beings. Newton and Clark tacitly assume that the Spinozists apply absolute necessity to infinite beings and finite beings, as one indeed would expect uh, from the PSR. Now, I think that two is true about Toland, but we've seen it's not true about Spinoza, because Spinoza, like Clark and Newton, bifurcates uh, existence between infinite existence and finite existence, um, and so that the realm of expressed determinations are not in Clark, Toland's, or Newton's sense absolutely necessary. So there is a sense in which the argument of the general, the sentence that I've quoted from the general scolium is successful against Toland, really is, not so successful to an informed reader of Spinoza, and I think much of 18th century philosophy, clearly not all of it, can be understood by Spinozistic responses to this argument. But that's a different project that I've tried elsewhere. Thank you. Very well. As to be expected, a very dense and challenging presentation. I expect a lot of questions. So who's wanting to take the floor? He's walking away from the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I really found that fascinating, and uh, I, I can't possibly engage with all of it. But I'm actually going to try to bolster your case against those who read um, that early passage as anti Cartesian, anti et al. Yeah. And, you know, they're very good historians of philosophy. But if you could put that up, yeah. So. Um, I actually think you have a very strong case for another reason, which is that although, as we all have seen, Newton is extremely critical of Descartes' view on infinity, yeah. he actually is pretty clear in one regard that he agrees with Descartes. So I think he's pretty clear that he agrees with the view in the third meditation that we can understand infinity without having to contemplate a finite being and then think of it as lacking limitations or negating its limitations. And I think that actually supports your reading of this <coughs> text because um, in a way, regardless of when that was written, very early on in, in De Gravitationa, right, I think Newton is clear that Descartes is right about the conception we have, the clear and distinct, if you like, conception we have of infinity. And Newton accepts Descartes' view that others are wrong to believe that we, that we could get the idea of infinity by taking the idea of a finite being and negating its limitations, all of that stuff. So I think that supports you. Yeah, and I think uh, connected to that, when you look at when he says to about Descartes, why Descartes doesn't go the move, let's uh, make space infinite because he's worried about being an atheist. The worry there is, is that Newton discerns that Descartes accurately has seen that if he makes that move, Descartes himself is a genuine Spinozist. And so, I think Newton very clearly sees Descartes trying not to fall into this trap. Um, and so it would be odd if here he would be arguing against uh, what he takes to be Descartes. So I, I think we agree about that, yeah. I think Degraff really helps that case. This may be the first time I've convinced an audience. <laughs> That's good. Well, it's my new strategy. I guess this is more a, a specific clarification of some of the conversation you've been having uh, further. But on this, you, this is the passage you say kind of shows that Newton disagrees completely with the cosmological and the ontological argument. Is that correct? Well, I think he thinks that um, 
the cosmological argument is really um, one um, you shouldn't try to try to generate. Okay, so he's, but in this way, you're saying like he is specifically responding to the cosmological argument, or is he responding to elements of the cosmological argument in other people's um, views? Or is there like a sense that he has like here's the cosmological argument, and I'm responding to that specifically? Um, well, I, we'd have to look at the larger context yeah. of the passage, but um, I think that what he discerns, and here, what I feel like I've speculated a lot, but what I'm about to say, I really think of as speculation. And that is, I think what he discerns is that the cosmological argument really is very unstable if you want to avoid uh, Spinozism. Okay. Um, and you see this in a way in a, in a Clark's demonstration, because, and also in Leibniz, because Whenever you go cosmological argument, you always have to add principles to avoid Spinozism. And the principles you add are precisely the ones that make the cosmological argument seem suspect. Because what, what the best versions of the cosmological argument give you is a very minimal God, hmm. a God that's not sufficiently Christian. And that's after Spinoza, that God is really suspect. So yeah. I think, I mean, we have as a whole, as a community, I think rightfully we have a sense that Newton is not a world-class philosopher. But I think in a way, what I've just said makes him see the implications of a very popular argument in a way that I think makes a lot of sense. Because when you read Clark, Clark veers into Spinozism regularly and then has to appeal to other principles to get himself out of Spinozism. And we know that Leibniz exploits this to great effect in the later exchange. I think if you just look at that, you say, hey, better not go there. Um, and I, th I think that's what he's saying in that first sentence. It wasn't the main point of my paper, but yeah. given yesterday's was, discussion. Uh, Thank you, Eric. You are a very discerning reader of Spinoza. Thank you. So I would like you to play a game with you. Uh -oh. Who was the same reader of Spinoza in 1704-1714? In the sense that you argue that in 1704, uh, Clark targets Toland. Now obviously, you should have been a discerning reader of Spinoza by then. And if he was, then why did he fall into the trap of targeting Toland in the way he did? And then of course, for the next 15 years, there will be uh, uh, quite a few of gymnastics to get out of it. And he binds Newton. He binds Newton. That's how my account is really what happens. Now, yeah. Clark was obviously far smarter than Newton when it came to metaphysics <laughs> and related <laughs> issues. Uh, something is going on here that I'm not getting out okay, of Okay, good. Um, so um, I should say um, um, Mo Henry Moore in his confutation and Clark in his demonstration have lots of very different arguments against the real Spinoza. Many of them extremely discerning, and, um, um, and one or two of them, I think, uh, potentially devastating to Spinoza's project. I mean, they require a lot of working out. Uh, what, um, but uh, I want to step back, one, I want to make one background thing, claim. One thing that unnerved uh, readers hostile to Spinoza is that Spinoza adopted the geometric method and seemed to hostile readers to get epistemic status from the geometric method. And this provoked Neuentheit, Moore, and Clark to start uh, offering arguments why you shouldn't be fooled by the format. That in fact geometry delivers less than meets the eye. What what Toland does really very cleverly is he takes arguments that were used to, as it were, neutralize the geometric method in Spinoza and say, hey, I can do the same neutralization against Newton. So he takes a set of arguments that, and arguments that are familiar to us from the <laughs> Jesuit versus Galileo debates about the status of mathematics and what these really could capture. And Toland says, don't be fooled by the Principia's mathematical form. It never can get you causal access. Oddly enough, or not oddly enough, that was Neuentheit's arguments against Spinoza. I'm not sure, uh, I mean, Toland gets there first, so it's not like 
but uh, Moore had already given a version of that argument in the confrontation. What, um, what uh, Toland does is to make it net incumbent on Clark to offer a separate argument for the uh, ruling out the activity of matter because Dolan has made clear if you buy into activity of matter, you reduce God's role to an absolute minimum. After the Bentley letters, that's not an attractive position for the Newtonians to be in. That's how I'm seeing the dialectic. Now there may be more, <laughs> more I mean, I haven't mentioned Raphson, I haven't mentioned a few others. There are all kinds of simultaneous developments, but I think this is kind of the main, the main, main line. Um, now one thing that's uh, where I'm really revisionary is that I claim, and we've talked a little bit about this, that Spinoza is not a fellow traveler of the scientific revolution and that he in fact doesn't really like uh, what we've come to call mathematical physics or mathematized natural philosophy. I have a whole set of separate arguments about that. What in a way Toland's brilliance is, is to say, hey, I can do this move on Newton as much as the anti-Newtonians have been doing on Spinoza. Did that make sense, or did I have too many epicycles in the air? <laughs> well, again, it's just a question of audiences here. I mean, who would be so astute well, I to think understand the... Uh, okay, so, so two things. Um, I think um, Clark's demonstration is one of the best books of philosophy in the English language ever. Um, George Boole, a 19th century authority, agrees with me. Uh, but I think, for about a I think for about 150 years, this was rightly seen as a fantastic book of philosophy. I think if you go through a demonstration, you'll find fantastic insight into Spinoza. I also think that if you look at Moore and Maclaurin, a lot of the things I'm saying turn out to be fairly conventional wisdom among sophisticated Newtonians. Having said that, neither Moore nor McLaurin is philosophically as uh, subtle as the Clark, I want to say. Uh, the other person who I think sees all of this and exploits it is Leibniz. And here I can really recommend Mogens Lurk's 1200 page book in French, where he goes through every passage where Leibniz discusses Spinoza, and uh, we see all these iterations uh, in Leibniz's thing. But that's you know, not available to this audience. But having said that, yeah, what I'm claiming is, and in fact, there's a letter that says this. In his letter to Butler, Clark says, yeah, I realize that all of my stuff on the cosmological argument is way too difficult for ordinary people. Um, that's why we have the uh, argument from design. Argument from design appeals to ordinary minds, cosmological arguments to the select few. But if you look at a demonstration, a good two thirds of it is really going through all the mechanics of the co cosmological argument in light of Hobbes and Spinoza. So I think, in a way, Clark sets the standard here. If Newton understood all of it, that's of course a different. Uh, I'm afraid we have to stop here. A very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for speaking there.